live. How are you, Jeff? I'm good, bro. How are you? Very good. Second podcast of the week. I know it's nice to be back at the pad or the lab yeah. 1.0, we can say. Yeah. Uh, honestly, this time of year is just still sunny, yeah. but not too hot. Yes. It's like my favorite time of year almost. And we're not wearing like super thick jacket in here. Yeah. Neither are we like boiling to death, which is the perfect Vancouver weather. 100%. Since we're talking about weather, uh, let's quickly talk about it was hot yeah. last month or during the whole summer. Did you enjoy your summer? Yeah, it was really good. I think uh, my fiance and I, we still managed to go on a little bit of a short hike in Squamish the other day. Uh, you know how Whistler that area is. There's a lot of like crystal clear blue water. So it was a really re nice way to wrap up the summer, I would say. You got everything you wanted to do this summer done? Almost, I'd say 90%. Good, yeah. I'm good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Um, okay, well, now that summer has finally concluded, and as everybody can hear, uh, see from the title, we are going through the stats for mm -hmm. the last month of summer, August. Uh, but before we get into the numbers, as per usual, talk to me. How was your August in terms of real estate? Well, uh, not to be a downer, but I had two deals collapse due to financing. Um, those could have been prevented. So uh, cautionary tale. Yeah. Don't quit your job um, prior to buying a property and not tell your mortgage broker. That's a pro tip. Right that one's for free. That's what it is. <laughs> free aside, advice. Free <laughs> advice for all of you yeah, today. Aside from there, I think buyers, there was still activity. Um, uh, yeah, I helped a buyer, two buyers secure a, a two bedroom out mm -hmm. in Surrey. It's a very yeah. nice listing. Yeah. Um, I believe it was one of your listings. That's so right. So very That's nice right. that we got to work together on that one. Yeah. And aside from that, I think there's a group of people who are waiting for spring to list or buy. There was some people that were waiting for the interest hike announcement, which mm -hmm. Thank God we are holding it steady for yeah. now. Today is September 7th, by the way, in case you're like, whoa, Jeff is <laughs> predicting into the future. No, no. Yeah. What yeah. about you? Um, kind of similar. I was kind of, you know, all my buyers and my sellers was kind of just slugging around, especially the early part of August. Nobody wanted to do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I was still busy, but like, touring people but then to take that extra step and putting down offers uh they don't want to do that all my sellers well you know all my sellers has now pushed into this junction of time mm -hmm. of wanting to list because they just didn't feel like summer was a good time personally or economically whatever like there was a bunch of reasons why yeah. everybody has kind of pushed into kind of this fall time frame mm -hmm. great foreshadowing about what we're about to talk about exactly <laughs> so without further ado why don't we dive into the numbers and start us off with sales activity as usual. Perfect, let's do it. Um, for the month of August for uh, 2023, we had a total of 2,296 sales. That is actually a 24 but sorry, 21.4% increase from last year. You remember last August, we weren't like, everybody was doing An nothing. Increase, what? <laughs> yeah. Increase in terms of sales active. 21% is quite a bit, Yeah. but it's actually a 6.5% decrease from last month. If you felt last month fell slow, this month obviously um, fell even slower, but I would say most likely this is a seasonal adjustment. Uh, but the key thing here is that we, in terms of sales activity, we are still 13.8% below the 10 your average for the month of August. Okay. That's big. Moving on to price, yeah. uh, our HPI price for August was uh, $1,208,400 mm -hmm. for a home in Vancouver and 2.5% increase from last August. Yeah. And uh, we were actually a 0.2% decrease from July. So I think that's the first decrease we've had in about seven months. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God it's only 0.2. We'll talk about why that's, uh, thank God for mm -hmm. that, right? Um, let's go into inventory. We've been kind of putting inventory as kind of the main focus for about two, three months now. Uh, monthly, so last month we had a total of 3,943 homes that got listed. That's an 18.1% increase from last August. So improvement there, uh, but it's of course 15.2% uh, below last month. I still call it seasonal, mm -hmm. uh, but the key thing is the best, I guess, gauge is that uh, for our new listings, we are 5.3% below the 10 year average. I'm a mixed bag about that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that, why that is the case. Uh, in terms of total inventory, at the end of August, we're now sitting at 10,082 homes total for sale. That is actually a 0.2% decrease compared to last year. Uh, and it's actually a 
sorry, 0.2%, sorry, I'll revert back to that, 0.2% decrease from last August and 2% decrease from last month. Hmm. The key note here is that our total inventory is still 13.4% below the 10-year average. I really look forward to the day where we can say that our inventory levels is above <laughs> the 10-year average, but... I mean, it's been below for a really long time now and you'll realize by now you hear our market update we always emphasize on that because yeah we give you the last month data but really you want to try to compare it to the 10-year average to kind of gauge like you know in terms of sales activity how has it been because every single month is a little different 100 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah let's take a look at the sales to active ratio so overall sales to active ratio is at 23.9 percent 14.2 percent for detached houses you mm -hmm. should remember this number we'll mm -hmm. come back to it in a little bit 30.3% for townhouses and 31.9% for condos and apartments. Now, generally, we do move on into the rent section. However, at the time of the recording of this podcast, uh, the August numbers were not up yet, mm -hmm. but we will circle back to July since the same thing happened last podcast and we didn't get a chance to share our update. Yeah. Uh, average monthly rate went up five months in a row to $2,406 per month this month. July, that's a 1.02% increase from the month prior. Yes. From June to July. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver one bedroom condo is now at 2,800, uh, 2,849 per month with downtown being over $3,000 per month and the UBC West Point gray area being 2,948 and a two bedroom at $4,393 per month. Yeah. And on average right now, um, people in Vancouver are spending 41.89% of their income on rent. So if you guys are feeling a tight squeeze in your pocketbook, that is probably why. I know we're gonna jump into thoughts right now, but I'm just gonna quickly comment on this. I feel like this number is low. I think so too. 41.89%. If I were to have $1,000, let's say $10,000 in income, I feel like, 60% would more so go to rent? That's that's kind of the number I was actually expecting. Yeah. Right? Because 40, what did they say? Like we should try to keep it 30. around 30%. 40% will feed the squeeze, but we're not feeling the squeeze of whatever we're actually feeling right now. That's why I'm a little bit shocked, mm -hmm. right? But thank you so much for that. Um, all right, let's get right into our thoughts now that the numbers are done. As per usual, Jeff, let's hear what Andrew List has to say on our market report this month. Sounds good. So I quote, uh, it's been interesting spring and summer market to say the least. To say the least. Uh, Andrew Lee's Real Estate Board of Gover uh, Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver's Director of Economics and Data Analytics said. Mm -hmm. And I quote, borrowing costs are fluctuating around the highest levels we've seen in over 10 years. Yet Metro Vancouver's housing market bucked many pundits' predictions of a major slowdown, instead posting relatively strong sales numbers and year-to-date price gains north of 8%, mm -hmm. regardless of home type, yep. end quote. <laughs> Another quote here starts, it's a bit of a tortoise and hare story this year with sales starting, sales starting this year slowly while prices increase due to low inventory levels, end quote, Lee says. Quote, as fall approaches, sales have caught up with the price gains, but both metrics are now slowing to a pace that is more in line with historical seasonal patterns and with what one might expect given that borrowing costs are where they are, end quote. Yeah, so just to add on, that's the reason why I was saying that uh, there's a couple of numbers that I want to kind of quickly bring up. That 5.3% below 10-year average for monthly new listings, mm -hmm. that gap is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. what, I, what am I trying to say? Well, there is actually more listings that's coming onto the market yep. in comparison to the 10-year average on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to quickly talk about uh, that kind of indicate to, just to see what Andrew was talking about uh, was da, 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 it was the um 0.2 percent decrease from july of 2023 sorry about that i'm mm -hmm. just going through my numbers here uh that is kind of like a good telling that okay what has what has happened well let's put it this way i'll just kind of translate everything august was pretty flat mm -hmm. as predicted 
Right, uh, because buyers and sellers are kind of just out on vacation. And that's and exactly like that. what you said, I feel like, uh, when we were filming the June update, and yeah. we were saying, like, hey, Jeff, what were your thoughts about the uh, summer? And I thought that, hey, you know, it's probably still going to be relatively busy because people do want to buy. Mm -hmm. However, I was wrong, and Joe was right, uh, as the numbers have indicated. Perfect. Uh, so, once again, how, do I how did I tell? I kind of indicated already, but I'll just kind of reorganize my thought to pass on to the listener. The reason why I feel like August was kind of flat from the seller side, total inventory only decreased by 2%, which is very little, aka there is no new sellers that, can, uh, that wanted to bring the home onto the market. Uh, and another thing is last month had little listings out and this month had 15.2% less than the 10 year, uh, sorry, uh, what did I say here? And this month had 15.2% less. Uh, so basically meaning that our listings actually compared to last month has dropped even further, mm -hmm. meaning that the sellers are completely on the sideline now and they just really wanted to enjoy their August vacation. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Now from the buyer side, how do I know it was flat? Well, there was 6.5% decrease from last month and still 13% uh, below 10 year average. And this is regarding, uh, I believe sales activity, 6.5% decrease. Okay, that tells you the buyers really ain't out there anymore. Yeah. Uh, and once again, I kind of really quickly touched base on this. There was a 0.2% decrease in price. Yeah, even though it's negative, I don't want to you know, get that out of proportion. 0.2%, I would say that the price kept flat from last month. <laughs> I'd say that's a conservative like thing to say too. Yeah, I yeah I know what I'm trying to say is, you, you remember what I said, we have even less listings, but our prices did not go off for August. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, that means that the buyer was also taking a break because exactly. if our listing was low, buyers are still up here, the prices would have shot up from last month. Yes, Yeah. basic supply and demand. The demand was lowered a little bit for August and I really look forward to what's gonna happen in the fall because generally, historically, it does have an uptick. Everyone's back to school. Parents have more time to go out and shop. And today being September 7th, I don't know if you saw the numbers, it's already kind of indicating <laughs> that way already. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, that's kind of what I want to say to summarize what Andrew's saying is August was relatively flat. Everything is kind of getting into the uh, closer towards the norm, which the norm for August just means nobody's doing anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right now, let's quickly move on to uh, sales and active ratio, because I know that you wanted to quickly talk about that section of things. Sure. Yeah. So uh, as I said earlier, it looks like uh, it's the second month where sales to active ratio has been uh, quite consistent yeah. uh, with the exception with the detached is having a slight drop yep, right now if you remember from the spring market mm -hmm. it was actually detached homes and condos that was leading the charge with a sales to active ratio mm -hmm. meaning it was more so a seller's market there yeah don't get me wrong right now it is still a seller's market for all three product types mm -hmm. we'll see if that changes yeah um, this is what I really wanted to highlight is that it seems like the raising interest rates have really uh, caught up with the detached house market, mm -hmm. obviously because those are the ones that are most expensive. Mm -hmm. Let's quickly use an example, right? Okay. Average price of a detached home in Vancouver is around $2 million. Greater Vancouver. Greater Vancouver. Vancouver is something else. Sure. <laughs> Vancouver West, sure, $4 million minimum, let's just yeah. say Greater Vancouver. Greater Vancouver. Actually, if you go to Stat Center and then you go Greater Vancouver and you go detach, it's actually sitting right at $2 million. Perfect. Right. Perfect. So two million dollars 20 percent down payment of that is 400k yeah that means you need to mortgage 1.6 million dollars yeah in today's interest rate we're gonna have a quote around 6.29 percent yeah that's a monthly payment of north of ten thousand five hundred dollars yeah. just a little bit over just a little that's bit. net right yeah. that's not even gross income yeah so let's take a little bit deeper dive into that the biggest debt to income ratio we've seen is 70 percent and that's if you know the mortgage specialist and you're like hey please buddy come on let's can you help me here right go ahead okay that means they need to make fifteen thousand dollars after tax to take home yeah pre-tax to spend 70 or 30 percent on your income that's thirty thousand a month that you need to make yeah or $360,000 a year. There's only one person in this room that makes over 360K a year. You mean the camera? And uh, that ain't me, so. 
<laughs> no. what I'm trying to say is everyone knows the people or the category of people that are making that type of money in Vancouver is very, very limited. Yes. Can you see where I'm getting with this and why the detached uh, market seems like it has slowed down a little bit? Yeah, I mean, if you break it down like this, regardless if they need a mortgage or not, they see these kind of number, they just go, oh, okay, okay, this is getting a little bit daunting <laughs> in a way. And I can like, I can see with all the detail houses that I've been selling or having buyers to buy, every single one of them is a cash offer. None of them is actually doing any finances because this is the stuff that you have to deal with. Yep. And with your example, this is a great example, by the way. But one more thing I was just say that this doesn't even talk about qualifying rates. <laughs> you know, qualifying rate needs to be 2% high. Well, actually more than 2%. Oh, so you're rates. about 9% now. Yeah. yeah. So that means that potentially you need to make more than $360,000 to put a 20% down on a single detach shop. And and for an average house in greater Vancouver real estate. Now you know why I didn't, I have to correct you when you say Vancouver. I'm like, no, this is greater Vancouver. <laughs> yes, I would really love to see like uh, us to pop up a list on salaries or uh, occupations that offer a salary of 400K or more in Vancouver, BC and see what we come up with. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So, you know, generally uh, I just want to add on with what you said about sales and active ratio. Now, now with single detached houses dropping to 14%, and I think this is the third month that has been below the 20%. Yep. So it is now kind of officially shifting away from the seller's market. So we, at the end of the podcast, we generally give advices for buyers and sellers. Well, I'm gonna jump the gun right now and give the advices to our buyers. If you are a buyer right now and you're thinking about upsizing, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is your market. Yep. Why? Because your condo or your townhouse, whatever you're trying to sell is still within, well, deep into the seller's market. But the house that you kind of want to buy, the competition has definitely lowered. You might be able to get a deal. You might be able to even do an inspection. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying you might be able to put some subjects on it? Ah, isn't that crazy? You don't have to, and you don't have to fight. You have to go through all these multiple offers should the numbers continue the way it is with single detached houses. So I won't wait till the end of the podcast. I'm just going to give you it right now. Buyers, this is the time, especially if you're upsizing, honestly speaking, right? And I'm, I don't think I'm the only agent that's speaking about this and mm -hmm. in Vancouver this kind of opportunity doesn't come often mm -hmm. where detached is slow and condos and townhouses are still deep into the sales market mm -hmm. and I'm going to go off script here a little bit I'm just going to add that also this is quite normal uh, I have been through about four real estate cycles now and I can always let people know that this is the order. When it goes up or when it comes down, it's always the houses first, mm -hmm. and then it trickles down to the townhouses, and then it trickles down to the condos, and then at the very least, it trickles down to the pre-sales. Mm -hmm. And that, once again, I mean this both ways, when it goes up or when it comes down, mm -hmm. right? So right now, what it seems like is happening is that we're on the way up to a point where it's already trickling down the, uh, uh, the effect into kind of condos. Mm -hmm. and very, very soon, I think, pre-sales as well, because there's a lot of pre-sale that's coming, and I think the developers knows this cycle, right? So I'm just gonna say that that's just another thing that I wanna quickly add uh, that I didn't put in here. Just, mm -hmm. this is all relatively normal, right? However, if, once again, as advice, if you're thinking about upsizing, this is it right now. Yeah. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to say in regards to kind of the sales and active ratio. Uh, I just wanted to spend a quick sec uh, about your favorite topic, which is rent. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we didn't have the last month's uh, data. However, since you're the expert of this subject, I would like to get your take on it. What do you think is gonna happen uh, for the report for August? Uh, do you think the rent went up, stay flat, or actually came down a little bit? I'm actually, I'm actually so curious. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I'm going to say that I'm always leaving a little room open to be wrong. Uh, but my gut feeling is telling me that uh, we'll probably see an increase about 40 to $50 a month okay. uh, for an unfurnished one bedroom unit. Couple of reasons why. Number one, um, summertime is generally when people I feel like do like to move or are hunting for new apartments, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're near any university campus. So I can imagine the UBC market is buzzing right now with people trying to get ready for September or it's already kind of late. It's already late. Like, last month, last month, people last month are already month. looking yeah. to move in. Yeah. Uh, not to mention, I'm not sure if you guys saw the article the other day about how Canada undershot um, their new immigrants by about 
just a casual million people. Uh, I'm gonna swear. <laughs> I, I was like this close to swearing already. <laughs> and I was just talking to two different clients the other day who were in the same situation where they were served a two month notice to yeah. move out and then now they have to buy a place. So I do feel like the activity is there. Mm -hmm. Has the inventory changed? Nope. You and I have talked about like, let's say there being more Airbnb units uh, coming onto the market if they were to change a policy. We already said that that's still not really going to change yeah. the demand or the supply enough mm -hmm. for us to see the um, average rent to drop by uh, over like one or two hundred dollars. Yeah. So given those reasons, I feel like we're still going to see an increase in rent over the last month. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like I like the crystal ball that Jeff is kind of <laughs> <laughs> trying to play with. But I do agree with you. I don't. I, I can't see any reasons for rent to come down. Yeah. And especially that we're moving into September, because remember, we're talking about August, not mm -hmm. talking about September. Like, yeah, like people are getting desperate. And when people are desperate, they're willing to spend the big money. And I think globally, like at least in North America, everything that I've read is that the millennials, Gen Z's, their debt is just stacking on more and more and more and more. So I, I really don't see a world where, why would the rent go down? There's no reason for it to go down. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Because the core issues of everything that we talked about for the last, I don't even know how, how many months it is now, none of them has been addressed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, but there is one thing that you talked about and let's uh, spend some time on it, uh, oh. which is the Airbnb. <laughs> Your new favorite topic. It's my new favorite topic. No, it was because we talked about it last month, like you said, but we have an update date this month yeah and you know what they just pick each other's brain to see how this is in case you're living on a rock <laughs> it's actually no uh I, I know still a lot of people don't know about this but new york city uh has actually just implemented their new airbnb rule uh that i want to quickly share with you and um basically i would like to say just kind of jump the gun saying this basically will kill airbnb in the in the city of New York or Manhattan, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Which, depending on where you're at, it might be really needed because I also learned that New York City one bedroom is now north of $5,000 USD. Nice. So, <laughs> just about seven grand or like 6,500 Canadian. We have a lot of room to grow here, Jeff, in terms of our rent. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. It's crazy. I'm joking. I'm joking. But in case you are not aware, let me just quickly do this uh, of the new law that New York City just passed in point forms. Number one, uh, I think it's starting, I think it's starting next week, actually. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a host, of Airbnb, you must register with the city in order for Airbnbs and other companies to actually get paid out, other companies, VRBO and stuff like that, they must check if the host registration has been approved. Apparently, if it's not approved, Airbnb and them don't get paid. Mm. So they're basically putting the responsibility to these uh, short-term rentals. I know of this system. I know, I think Japan has been doing this for a really long time now, basically saying you have to register, you have to register because I think people are avoiding taxes and stuff like that. But the biggest difference between Japan and New York City is Japan has a bunch of, they call it Akias or empty homes that is just mm -hmm. there because of the population, whatever. Whereas in New York City, you were just talking about one bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Rent north of $5,000 USD. Right? Okay, so that's the first uh, thing. The second thing is not only do you have to register, Airbnbs going forward, you cannot have two, more than two guests staying at the same time. So that kills families off like you can't bring kids anymore are you talking about only like a one bedroom there can't bring no. more than two people or any, any Airbnb? airbnbs okay and then here's another thing you know why there's only limited because the host and the visitors oh sorry the host must physically be present during the guest stay and share the living quarters with their guests so that means that those condos that you just airbnb out here, oh, just go get the keys at the certain mailbox at a certain time. That's done. So family is done. Individual condos with nobody living there, that's done too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last thing is, this one drive me nuts. A lot of people actually, a lot of articles didn't pick this up. I had to dig deep. Hosts and visitors must leave the doors inside the dwelling unlocked so the occupants can access the entire unit. So you can't be like, oh, okay. this is my storage room. I have it locked. Uh, when I did Airbnb, actually the, uh, this, the, the, uh, the most recent example is when I went to Osaka with our group of friends, every Airbnb, there's one room that you just can't open. 
And you know, my girlfriend Rita was always like, oh, what's behind this door? Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently in New York City, starting next week, you can't even do that anymore. It sounds like they're just trying to regulate it so tightly that people will not be motivated to even try. Basically. And that's, that, I mean, that's not an uncommon tactic. Yeah, because New York City, apparently, according to this article, has over 40,000 Airbnbs. 40,000. <laughs> we have what, a thousand? No, I think last time I quickly checked, I, I mean, there's probably more than that, but just on the market available that mm -hmm. I saw, that I chose something that's one month out, I think downtown, well, not actually not downtown, like in Vancouver, including east side and west side was yeah. like 1900. Okay. So let's assume that some of those booked, but it was like what, 3,000? Mm -hmm. It's not 40,000. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right? So what does it all mean? I kind of already stated it. This is basically going to kill Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Like completely. Completely. I wish I could be a fly on the wall right now in their conference room and just like hear the, <laughs> the language that they must be using after this was passed. Right. Why do you think this happened? Like, why do you think specifically, other than the unaffordability, do you think there's something going on behind the scenes? Well, our hotel's not doing well in New York. Is I know, why? I do, bro. I doubt it, right? I you highly tell me, doubt. You're the, out of here, you're the person that. Person I would that like to say recently. is that I think it is coming from the social pressure. Mm -hmm. Because to five thousand dollars a month for one bedroom, and you know that one bedroom condo in New York City, Manhattan, ain't a one bedroom condo in Vancouver. You know that New York City, like some of the condos are like over 100 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine paying $5,000 USD. And you probably don't get oh, a parking. Oh, we both watched Cash Jordan and we basically <laughs> type of property you, 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 you literally have to walk up, there's no elevators for you, right? So that's the first thing. Manhattan, Airbnb, you're done, right? Mm -hmm. Second thing is I can probably see, because I do know that a lot of people are so accustomed to Airbnb now because they get the washer and dryers, they get the kitchen and stuff like that. So I think New Jersey and Brooklyn, their Airbnb is gonna be off the rockers. Like mm -hmm. they're all just gonna go there until the government do something about those cities. Mm -hmm. right? Those are the two things I immediately, uh, immediately thought for uh, thought of then of course coming down to the main question I'll ask you first do you think this is going to be successful into curbing the rental crisis in New York City because I'm not going to talk about is this going to be killing Airbnb yes it's going to kill Airbnb in, yeah. in that specific city but is it going to help knowing that, that fact that there's 40,000 Airbnbs that's out there hmm I think it'll definitely make a shift. It's going to make a big splash and things are going to change pretty drastically very quickly. But yes, they have all these new restrictions. How quickly and efficiently are they going to be able to start enforcing them? I don't know. What's the lag going to be like? Is it three months from now? Is it six months from now? Is that infrastructure going to be a year out from now yeah. until we see a change? That's, That's a, what I have a big question mark about. Very good question. So in the article, they're saying that the re they had some of these rules for Airbnb back in New York City, like years ago, apparently. Yeah. But they didn't have anyone to enforce it. Yeah. You're telling me that someone's going to go check 40,000 homes on the daily to make sure every single door is unlocked? So now, <laughs> because of the social issue, yeah. what New York City is, is that they are getting staff in there to make sure that this gets followed to a T. <laughs> it's a bunch of bullshit to me. Uh, it's just, yeah, I don't see it being able to enforce, to be enforced to that degree. I honestly don't. Okay. I mean, I, I would like to say, I mean, it all depends on how much money they want to throw at this problem. Mm -hmm. Because there's a money issue, right? Yeah. You're just hiring staff, right? My second question is, what do you, do you, I'm sorry, let me revert that. My second question is, do you think other cities gonna pick up? I'm not talking about Vancouver, it, specifically I'm talking about other cities in North America or even in Europe. Potentially. I think yes. I think people will give it a try because I, there's gonna be a lot of public outcry about like, hey look, even a big city in North America like New York is doing this. Mm -hmm. The government, you have to do something to help because this is a global issue. It's yeah. not just New York City that deals with an unaffordability. Yeah, I guess just New York City is so far on the, on the extreme. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's extreme. Like for example, I think, well, I almost say San Francisco, but I mean, their downtown is dying on its own with all any Airbnb issues. I'm not gonna get into that. But I can see like a place like Hawaii. I can see a place like Miami. Mm -hmm. I can see a place like LA implementing something like this. So does that mean everyone's gonna start buying timeshares again in uh, Hawaii? 
I, I mean, it depends if the government really wants to play hardball mm -hmm. and they're getting enough social pressure now, for, at least in the United States, that they need to do this. There, this could revert back to you know your BNBs. I guess capitalism doesn't win every time. Well, are we really truly still in a capitalism? <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that, right? Yeah. And lastly, do you think this is something Vancouver should pick up and do? I would like to say no. Okay. But I feel like sometime it is gonna come up. And why no? I, I just want to stay on that topic. Why no? Mm, well, you and I off camera, we talked about tourism yeah. and how, you know, by making these kind of changes, it really will kill your tourism market because who wants to pay $700 a, a night for a, for a bedroom in a downtown Vancouver for a hotel? Right. Not a lot of people want to do that. And we're definitely not building enough hotels. And, <laughs> and when people travel, generally people travel with family. Yes. So... I'm sorry to say, BC and Vancouver specifically, we thrive on tourism. That's like one of our biggest mm -hmm. like income generators. Yeah. So if they were to make a move like that, they're literally shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, and when was the last time a hotel was built in downtown Vancouver? What was the last the one? The newest Trump? hotel is probably Trump. either Trump Hotel or the Fairmont Pacific Rim. I think those two were probably the newer ones. Right, but we took away Landmark Hotel. <laughs> right? Okay, and now Trump Hotels, they've rebranded, now they're Paradox, so that's probably the yeah. newest one. That was already at least eight years ago? Yeah. Th you know what I'm trying to get to, right? <laughs> of like, course. We did build a new hotel, but uh, the last time we built a new hotel, we also tear down a massive one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think... I think City of Vancouver would jump on this as if any West Coast city in the States jumps on this. Yeah. Let's say Seattle, let's say San Fran, let's say San Jose, let's say LA, let's say San Diego. If any one of them jump, uh, like jump into it, then I think Vancouver is like, oh, look, it's somewhat successful. We should try to do that. And let's have a candid conversation here. Canada, there's no city in Canada that's actually a leader. We just follow whatever the US is doing. Hence why you use the example. If there was a West Coast city south of here. Yeah, I'm not even talking about Toronto. Exactly. Usually I didn't even point out Toronto. I'm like, oh, is Toronto implemented? We might not even implement it. I'm glad we're on the same page about that. Right, right. It is just so interesting because for me, personally, we got to understand that this came from the States. And the States is the godfather of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And New York is the big apple. Mm -hmm. So they signify like, this is where capitalism can take you. But what they just did here is very non-capitalist. <laughs> they basically got the rug pulled out from under them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. So on a side note, imagine if you're one of these landlords or business owners that you just run all these Airbnbs in Manhattan. <laughs> Where are all the influencers that says you can grow your Airbnb business? I see those all the time on Instagram that they try to tell you, buy my course and I'll t teach you how to become a millionaire through Airbnb. Oh, and you are never as powerful as the government. <laughs> nope, big brother always wins. Of course. All right. So um, now before we conclude our podcast here, um, that was a very good conversation, by the way. I, I, maybe there's something else that's going to come up for Airbnb that we can talk about next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said previously for the podcast, I already gave the advice for the buyers this month. Yep. So why don't you give the advice to the sellers this month for any seller that's kind of right on the fence about should they sell, should they not sell, what should they be doing? Okay, well, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to take exactly the example that Joe used a little bit earlier. If you were a seller who was looking to upsize into a detached home, now may be a good time. So it really depends on your own personal situation and your goals. If you were selling your place and relocating, then obviously you have a need to sell, so make sure you do it now. We have that one client who's relocating back to Toronto, We're list, got her place listed within three weeks, so now would be the time. Mm -hmm. If not, if you can't get your place ready by November 1st, then maybe hold off until the spring when things settle a little, a little bit more, and then do a reassessment then. I 100% uh, agree. Mm -hmm. It almost it just came out of my mouth. 
<laughs> good job, good job. Um, yeah, and that pretty much concludes this particular podcast here. Awesome. Yeah, so why don't you take the lead? Sure. If you guys uh, felt that uh, you earned, learned a little bit of information through our podcast, please make sure you remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share it with your best friend. Yeah. Um, once again, my name is Jeff. My name is Joe. We're the Mike for Vancouver Real Estate. We'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next week with a new episode. Bye, guys. See ya.